Yes. Now it is my yeah. pleasure to introduce Lindsay Jensen. Lindsay has been in real estate for over six years now. She's a brand ambassador for Turning Point USA, a lead instructor for a realtor safety course in partnership with U.S. Law Shield, serves on the board of directors for the Boots for Warriors Foundation, and is an occupational author. She currently lives in Fort Worth, Dallas, and enjoys spending time with her family. Lindsay, thank you so much for being here with us today. I know you're going to talk about more about you background and why safety matters so much to you. And we're very excited to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you so much. I am very glad to be here. Um, you know, I wish we could all be together in a class and I could see your faces and we could interact, but please do use the chat to ask questions, make comments. Um, I would love to hear from you guys. And I really do believe this topic is super important, maybe the most important um, topic you will hear about in your career um, and in life. So let me start by just telling you a little bit more about myself. Um, I am not a full Texan, but I consider myself a part Texan. I was born and raised in Colorado. So Fort Collins, Colorado is where I was born and raised. Um, and my father was a developer and builder there. So actually one of my very first jobs and um, before I could even drive, my dad would take me to his model homes and I would clean the houses for the real estate agents to come sit and show over the weekends. So it's funny to come full circle and now be in real estate myself. Um, I actually worked for Jensen Homes growing up doing everything from cleaning to you know, more interesting jobs, marketing, um, going with my dad, kind of like a personal assistant. I would go with him out to development projects. I would go um, to the bank. I would meet with engineers. So I really got to see the whole building process. And then I left for college and I went to the University of Kansas and decided I was going to be a speech language pathologist and not follow in my dad's footsteps yet. Um, so anyways, I, I started, I, then moved to Texas and I did my master's at University of North Texas um, and never left. So I've really loved it here. Um, I love Texas. We've been bringing some of our Colorado family to move this way as well. And, um, you know, when I worked as a speech therapist, though, I worked um, in home health and in schools, but there were many times that I was going to um, neighborhoods that were very high crime. And um, it was then that I really started to think about, okay, what would happen if I'm put into a situation where I have to protect myself? Like what, how am I going to be safe? I'm a single woman going out here. I was, you know, fresh out of college. Um, you know, what am I going to do? And do I, am I prepared? And so that's kind of what started it. I will say I was raised in a family where, you know, safety was talked about and um, I saw, you know, my dad had firearms in the house. And so he talked about, you know, the, the safety and the risk involved in that, but also, you know, why he had it in the house for us. Um, so it was something that I, I had been, you know, used to in my family, but when you then are an adult and you're out of college and you realize, oh my gosh, well, it's just me now. Like, how am I going to take care of myself? That's when I really started to think about safety. So fast forward, worked in speech and um, pathology for a while. And then over the years, my dad has consistently said, you've got to get into real estate. You would be so great in real estate. You like, you know, houses and you love people. And so you should do this anyway. So I listened to him and started real estate um, just about six years ago. And it's been an awesome journey um, and a challenging career. And, and I love, love, love the brokerage I'm with. I'm with the Ashton Agency in Fort Worth. It is just a phenomenal place to be. Um, we work, I work specifically in residential and farm and ranch. Um, and so, you know, with that comes different types of safety you have to be concerned about, you know, being in rural, rural areas being in cities and more commercial type areas. Um, so all of that, you know, I still had to carry and consider, you know, carry on this, this thought process of how am I going to be safe in this career? Because as you know, we often work by ourselves. So um, today's class, we're going to, it's going to be an overview. Um, 
of a few things that you will hear about if you attend the upcoming class that's being offered through HAR on um, September 27th at 10 a.m. It's going to be at their central location, and I think we can put the link to register for that um, in the chat. It's an in-person class. It's a class that I also teach um, at times through Texas Law Shield or U.S. Law Shield, and that will be taught by Mike Wong. He's excellent, and it is a really, really, really good class. Like I said, there's going to be a few things that we talk about today that you might hear from him, but he's going to elaborate on a lot other of other topics, so I'm going to kind of talk about that. Um, anyway, so today class safety starts with you and I said it's kind of a prequel to safety has no asking price which is the class Mike will teach um told you a little bit about myself there if you have any questions I'm happy to answer um what will you learn today so you will learn how to avoid being a target for a crime to the best of your ability obviously you know, some things are unavoidable. We understand that, but there is a lot you can do to prevent yourself from being a victim. So I really want to want to talk about that um, with you guys today. I want to talk about why and how to trust your intuition, how to improve your awareness, ways to prepare yourself for worst case sc scenarios. Excuse me, um, without being you know, without living in fear, I want you guys to be thinking through safety, planning for worst case scenarios. But obviously, I never want um, anyone to feel afraid. Um, you need to be confident. But that's what just like everything in life, when you prepare for it, you are more confident and can handle something. If something takes you by surprise, then, you know, the greater chance you're going to have anxiety or be fearful. So that's one of the things we really want to Make sure you understand today. Um, and then I want to give you some safety measures you can put into practice immediately. So those are our objectives today. I am going to start with a little safety stats pop quiz. And I wish we were all in person for this. But um, let me start by asking, I don't know if anybody can throw this in the chat, but I'm wondering if anybody out there watches Dateline or watches True Crime. So... I am a huge true crime junkie, but I always say as much as I love watching Dateline, I never, ever want to be featured on it. And I don't want any of you to be featured on it. Um, I want us to take safety very seriously, um, learn from other situations. And um, like I said, if you're a true crime junkie, then just remember, it's fun to watch that show, but please, please take it seriously because we don't ever want to see you on it. So safety stats. First of all, the typical real estate agent meets prospective clients whom they've never met before, either at their office or in a neutral location, what percentage of the time? So this is, you know, you a, an agent who doesn't know this client, it's a, it's a new client, maybe it's a Zillow lead or something, how often? Okay, we have some guesses. 90%, 50, ooh, 75, 75. Okay, ready for the answer? 65% of the time. So that's still, I mean, that's 45% of people that will put themselves in a really dangerous situation going to a location with someone they have not met before. And oftentimes, as you know, even if there's sellers living in a house, you're going to a vacant house. You're basically going to an empty crime scene where someone can't hear you. Um, so that's a number that I hope will improve. And I hope all of you aren't going to be, you know, part of that 45, that you're part of the 65. And let's increase that percentage. Okay, next one. Oh, and it's listed as number one, but that's number two. Um, what percent of men and what percent of women carry a self-defense weapon or tool? What do you guys think? How many men, women, what do you think? Ooh, 40, 10. Okay. Men, 90. <laughs> okay. 40% men, 15% women, 55, 35, 25 and five. 30 and 40. Okay, so let's see what the answer is. 46% of men, 
and 52% of women. So actually a few more women, um, according to, this has come from the um, NAR safety report in 2021. According to this, 52% of women carry some sort of self-defense tool. Now, remember, when we talk about self-defense tools, that could be pepper spray. That was like one of the main things that they said, realtors said they carried. Um, so it's not always a firearm. Um, then blank percent of realtors have personal safety protocols in place that they follow with every client. 30%, okay, 50%, 74, 25, 60%. You guys are awesome. Thanks for using this chat so it doesn't feel like I'm just sitting here talking to myself. <laughs> 75, okay, so the answer... 72%. You guys were good. There's a couple of you that got almost right on the dot. Now, the crazy thing is, is I have a hard time believing that stat. I know it's what was reported, but on the in the many classes that I've taught over the past, I guess it's been two and a half, three years that I've been teaching um, in association with U.S. Lash Shield. And I always ask my classes, and most of the time I'm in person, but I always ask my classes, you know, how many people have safety protocols set up? And maybe half the class says they have these set up. Maybe. A lot of times it's fewer than that. So it's crazy because I just think it's something, you know, we many people just don't think through. They just, you know, get very comfortable in their surroundings and in the neighborhoods they go to and they get, you know, focused on business and they aren't always thinking that way. And in some ways, you know, like I said, it's a very fine line. Last thing I want are real estate agents to be living in fear and scared and worried. You know, we don't need any more of that in our world. However, you know, there's a, there, there should be some awareness and there should be some thinking through this because your safety is important. It's important, obviously for yourself, but to your family, to your loved ones, to your business, um, so it's, it's something I, you know, I hope that number's correct, but if it's not, I hope all of you will do this. Um, and then among those who participate in a realtor safety course, what percent said they feel more prepared for unknown situations after taking the course? Oh, it popped up. Sorry. <laughs> Good job, you guys. You're all the smartest. <laughs> Well, that was my fault. 39%. And I was actually like, okay, we need to get that number a lot higher. Um, I want all of you that are listening today, every single one of you to feel more prepared for, you know, in some form or fashion. So I really hope that that number increases. And I hope that you learned something today that you can use. Um, and I highly encourage you, if you can attend that in-person class, it's a really, really interesting, fun class. I actually... I have had people, as I've taught this class, say, this is the best CE course I've ever had. And I don't think it's necessarily because I'm teaching it. I think it's because the content is so good and it's really got some great like safety tips. And he goes more into different self-defense tools and options and weapons and more into what happens um, if you have to use self-defense. So it's very, very interesting. I highly recommend. Okay. All of you are super smart. 39%. All right, let's see here. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about and something that is so, so important um, is trusting your gut. Okay, so we've all heard the term, trust your gut. And, but what does it really mean? And of course, you know, people, you know, attribute this to a lot of different things. Some people attribute it to a higher power, to God, to the Holy Spirit. Some people attribute it to, um just your human body and, and trusting your own self and trusting your own intuition. And we hear this all the time. Um, but you know, do we ignore it or do we listen to it? And are we trained to really think about, wait, is that my, is that my intuition telling me something or do you ignore it because we're busy and, you know, we just get thinking about other things. Um, the human body is fascinating and it is able to give us warning signals for danger. And, you know, there's like, if you look into this, I did some reading on this prior to um, teaching today. And it's like, there's so many different 
research studies out there of, of people trying to really pinpoint like why the human body does this, but we know it does it for us, does it for animals, um, but our body senses danger. And that's such a gift. I mean, whether you believe it's from God or just science, it is such a gift. And it's something we really need to start listening to and um, honing in on. And, you know, those those different things that that tell us something's wrong. It can be maybe just a, you know, could be a slight uneasy feeling, just something that just doesn't sit right. You could get maybe more physical symptoms like anxiety, sweating, nervousness, maybe a panic attack maybe a stomach ache, you know, any other physical symptoms you guys toss in the, in the chat, that would be something you feel when, um, when there's danger, you know, what, what does your body tell you? Um, it's very, very astute and it will tell you if there's danger or if something is not lining up quite right. Um, and over and over, we see people that had a gut feeling, um, and either listened to it and avoided danger or didn't and, you know, ended up in a really, you know, terrible, sometimes tragic life ending situation. So listening to your gut, I cannot overstate that out of all the things you hear today, I hope that this is what you take most, most seriously. There is no sale that is ever worth your life. None. So no price tag, no commission that is ever worth your life. Even if you are wrong, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but, um, you know, as realtors, we are often targeted and I'm sure you guys can, you know, think why we are. I mean, is there anybody that wants to put some reasons down in the chat? Why do you think real estate agents are targeted above some other careers um, by criminals? What do you guys think? Access to homes, very good, very true. Anyone else? I think one of the first, you know, things that I think about is that we are often working alone. You know, we are often by ourselves. We are often in vacant or, you know, if not a vacant house then or, or building, then, you know, a place where there's no one home at the time. Um. You know, there's a, this assumption that every real estate agent is making big bucks. Oh, good one. Yes, they know what we look like ahead of the ahead of time. That is so true, especially now with social media and all of the internet presence we have. People know exactly what you look like. Um, and they probably know a lot about you if they've done their research, if they're actually targeting you. Um, yep, very good. Many, many reasons. You're right. And, you know, the other thing is, is they, they see what I was going to say is they see us as, you know, people who maybe have really nice things, you know, which is always funny because I'm like, do they think real estate agents like just make all this cash we're carrying around? Like it's such a grind, you know, but they do. They see us as like people who make good money. They see a nice car. They see very nice jewelry. And sometimes that can be the motivation but a lot of times it's just the ease and just the um, accessibility and the opportunity of us being by ourselves, um, being in a vulnerable situation alone with someone that intends to cause harm. Um, so, and I wanted to just share this, this story. Um, you know, I think all of us, if we think about like times in our life, we've had that phenomenon of a gut feeling where you really can't even explain, like wasn't that there was something, I mean, of course, there's times when we're in like a true da dangerous situation that's very evident and we all can see that. But I'm talking about that time where you have an uneasy feeling and it doesn't even necessarily make sense, but you're like, something is, is off. So in 2017, my family lives in Colorado, some of my family still lives in Colorado. And I was flying back from Denver to Texas. So I was at the Denver airport. And we had some delays because of weather. And so I was sitting at my gate for an extended period of time. I was there a few hours probably. And I was sitting there and, you know, this is 2017. I've flown, I fly all the time. I fly a million times back and forth to, to Denver and, and Dallas. So I'm sitting there and there's a, a man in at the same gate who by like appearance wise, was there was nothing that, you know, really 
screamed out. He was a, a nice looking man. Um, it wasn't anything necessarily apparent, but um, the the way he was acting and some of the different languages he would he would be on a phone call in this language and very kind of boisterous and almost like trying to act as if he was fitting in. But really, above all that, there were there wasn't like something specific about this man. Um, but there was something inside of me, and I'm not a very fearful, anxious person in general, but there was something inside of me that just had such an uneasy feeling about this man. So I called my parents and, um, you know, was talking to them before flying off. And I just said, Hey, you know, would you guys say a prayer with me? I'm, you know, believe in, in God and prayer. And so I was like, well, you guys just say a prayer. I don't know. I, this is so unlike me, but I have the most uneasy feeling about this man that's in my same gate. So they do, you know, and as when I go to get on the plane, I sit down and as the man is coming down the aisle to get on the plane, I snap the picture. So I, I still have this picture today. As a matter of fact, I'll never like delete it. It's such a crazy story. Anyway, so I take a picture of this man and I text it to my parents and I said, and this is weird, but this is just, this is the guy I have a very uneasy feeling about just so you know. Okay. Love you. You know, anyway we're sitting there and you normally, you know, if your flight isn't leaving on time, the captain is getting on and saying, you know, sorry, we're, we're having to, um, de-ice, um, you know, all the things. Well, no one is saying anything, but we're still at the gate, still at the gate, still at the gate. And then suddenly U S marshals come on and this man is removed from my airplane. True story. Like true story. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, like there is nothing specific about this man that screamed, you know, danger. It besides just this gut feeling and some of the ways he acted that I thought almost were was trying to draw too much attention to himself. Anyway, just a reminder, you know, your gut, your intuition is oftentimes spot on, even when you feel you know, oh, I don't want it to be wrong or I don't want to offend somebody or, you know, but I'm telling you, that was like one of the craziest stories. And the crazy thing when this guy got pulled off the plane, I mean, you know, they can't just take someone off the plane for, without reason. And um, the there was a girl behind me who said, oh my gosh, I had the worst, like most uneasy feeling about that man. And I had, you know, called my parents. I'm like, me too. So anyway, just a little story there, a little aside on, listening to your gut. Oftentimes it is right on. Um, the back too. So real estate agents are often targeted. And, you know, as we mentioned, it's because we're often alone. We're often, you know, in vulnerable situations at a vacant house. It was interesting. I, as I said, I love true crime. I was listening to um, an audio book that was talking about the Golden State Killer. I had no idea, but in his reign of terror in California, he targeted real estate agents at time again, because they were alone. So just something to take very seriously. And so as we think about using your intuition, you know, I want to talk to you about um, some case studies. Okay. Well, let's see here. We are going to look at four case studies today. Beverly Carter, Soren Arn Olschlegel, Lindsay Buziak, and Thomas and Jackie Hawks. And I'm sure, you know, there are so many others too, and there may be others that you guys are aware of as well, but we're going to, we're going to start here. And I want to start by just saying, um, just expressing my absolute like sympathy for each of the people that we're going to talk about today. And um, for the, these are victims, there is no one to blame for their crimes besides the perpetrators, no one. And so, you know, today when I'm talking to you guys, by no means do I want to assign any sort of blame to these innocent, you know, people. I want us to just see if there if there's anything we can learn from their story, from their situation. And I know like Beverly Carter, um, actually her family um, started a foundation and they're one of the ones that really pushed for the, you know, real estate associations ever, everywhere to start taking safety seriously because of her story. And so I say this with just, you know, like I said, just such heartfelt sympathy for these, these people. This is someone's, you know, wife and mother and grandmother and friend and colleague. And, um, you know, I want you guys to see her picture because I think it's important to see these people and know they are people just like you and me. They, you know, 
when uh, when about a regular day of work thinking what we always all think which is it'll never happen to me and I'm fine and it and it happened to them so it's just something to take very seriously so I'm going to read something from her foundation page um that I thought was you know important and I and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about her story and what we can learn from it so um this quote said, what Beverly didn't know was that her clients, a man and a woman who had identified themselves as a relocating married couple, weren't looking to buy a home. They had a sinister plot in mind to use Beverly to get quick cash and what started as a great day for her ended tragically. Beverly was kidnapped. Her captors intended to obtain ransom money from her family. When the ransom didn't go as planned, Beverly's kidnappers became her murderers. She was killed in an attempt to cover up their initial crimes. And the perpetrator was quoted saying, I just wanted her gone. He said in the January 2016 trial. And when asked why Beverly, her killer explained that she was a woman that worked alone. She was a rich broker. Beverly's death was a devastating tragedy to her husband, children, grandchildren, extended family and many friends. And although Beverly had followed many industry standard safety protocols, it wasn't enough. Within the in industry she loved, Beverly's murder catapulted a national conversation about safety to the forefront of real estate organizations. So Beverly was a real estate agent in Arkansas. And some of you may be familiar with her story. It's definitely one um, that I think is talked about, you know, quite a bit. And there's been different TV shows on and, and all of that. Um, but I thought what was interesting as I've studied this case is that her friends said and, and her colleagues said that she had a gut feeling that something was a little bit off when she got the initial call by these clients. So when she got the call from the man, apparently she felt like something was off and she asked to speak to his wife and confirmed with the wife now you're going to be there as well yes so then she you know the house they wanted to see was a house that was actually located not too far from her home um it was in an area that she knew very well they had said they were cash buyers and so she decided okay i'm gonna go so when she when she shows up at the house um these two end up kidnapping her and she ends up dying a very, very tragic, torturous death. Um, and those details, you can, you can read more about that um, online. But one of the things that I want to just talk about is, is what can we learn, you know, from her story and, and from her situation? So one of the the things that just again like as i was reading this and seeing that she had that feeling that something maybe wasn't quite right you know and, and she had told like she she gave expectations to her husband of what time she was going to be home told the address of where she was going to show a house she did these things you know letting people know but again like if you go to a vacant home it doesn't matter if someone knows where you are if you cannot protect yourself the first thing i would say is you know that gut feeling that she had was there for a reason. And, um, you know, instead of meeting someone at a house, I implore you to meet them at a neutral location. You know, you it, a lot of times we'll say, meet them at your office or neutral location. If your office has cameras set up and there's going to be a lot of people there, great. If it's not, because I know a lot of people do work from home, um, you know, maybe your brokerage office is not as busy on a specific day, maybe it's a weekend, then meet somewhere and scope this out, you know, already, like you have this planned. If you're ever in this situation with a client that you don't know that you get a call from, think about where can you meet them first? Um, you know, even ask someone to go with you if you have to, but meet at like, let's say you're going to go to a Starbucks, know that there's cameras in the area, know that um, it's going to be busy at that certain time of day. And um, a lot of times this is going to stop and hinder a criminal right there. So if you say, you know, okay, great, I'm going to need, you know, our brokerage requires, you can always blame the brokerage. Um, our broker requires that we get, a, you know, a driver's license um, before we show any houses. 
Um, and you know, I'll need to meet you here. You can even say, I need Wi-Fi. This is the location that I often set up. I'll be working. I have a couple other appointments that day. So I'll need you to come to this Starbucks and you know, we'll be signing some paperwork and I'll be getting your identification and then make the showing for the following day. Have time to check it out, have time to check them out, I should say. Um, and really just also a lot of times, um, yes, good job, Grace. Yes, coffee shops. A lot of times too, someone that's looking out to, I mean, this this was a targeted situation that these people had a sinister plan from the beginning. This wasn't just like they were driving by and saw going to the house. You know, they planned and thought through this. If she would have said, you know, and, and again, we don't know, but if she would have said, let's meet this, meet, you know, this coffee shop first, let's get, um, I'm going to get your license. Then, you know, you at least have time to do some recon. You can look them up. A lot of times they won't show up. A lot of times at that point they say, okay. And they either won't show up or they say, well, I'll call you back, you know, after I can schedule and they'll move on to someone else besides you, or maybe they'll just be deterred from doing it. We hope, um, you know, from committing the crime in the first place, but it is super, super important if you do not know this person to never show up to a house. It doesn't matter what they say. Like I said, no sale is worth your life. Um, when the police got to the scene, uh, when her, when she didn't come home and her husband called the police to say she was missing, um, they found that she had like a post-it note on her folder and it had their email, had their phone number. But when they did the, when they searched that, it was fake. So maybe had she, you know, had more time to look into that, she would have figured that out as well. Um, so just, just doing those little, little things to, to ensure your safety are so important, you know, and even though this was a couple, you know, you think, oh, a married couple, like it's not, you know, that it's surely they're, they're harmless. You just don't know, you know, unfortunately criminals come in all, all size and shapes and genders. And so, you know, we, we've just got to, we've got to put into practice these, these things. And someone that is a serious buyer is going to respect that and honor that. And, you know, they're going to be, they're going to say no problem. And so you treat them to coffee and it's, and it all goes well, and you're, you don't have a bad feeling and you move on and you were, you know, you weren't, you weren't wrong in your, in your thoughts or you were right. And um, so anyways, that's one of the main things we can, we can definitely think through with that. The other thing is too, is let's just say, okay, you know, she, did meet them at the coffee shop. They do give a license from what she can check out. They look fine. She, her gut says, oh, maybe they're just fine. And she goes to the house. You know, once you get to that house, and we're going to talk about this more at the end of the webinar too, but once you get to that house, you know, then you really are, you're, you're the first line of self-defense. So what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do if you have to face danger? So we'll get to that more later, but that is Beverly's story. If, like I said, there's lots of information online. You can read about this sweet woman and just what is sad, sad turn of events that happened. Unfortunately, they did catch um, the people who committed this this act. And um, yeah, it is. It's the saddest. Oh, and um, they are in prison. But I just, you know, again today, I mean, I say in all seriousness, as much as I love true crime, like I would never want anyone I know care about or love you know, to be in this picture. So I just, you know, I know that Beverly's family pushes the the safety talk because they wish that she had, you know, listened to her gut because she definitely had a feeling that something wasn't right with this couple. Um, Our next case study is 41-year-old Soren Arn Olschlegel. And this case actually happened in 2021. Um, it's a kind of a different scenario. So this uh, realtor was a realtor in Virginia. He had a buyer that bought a house sight unseen from Alabama. And I think all of us in Texas know how that went, like in 2021 and even the end of 2020, you know, we had, it was such crazy times and there were people buying houses and moving in, not seeing the houses. Um, and so this happened in Virginia. They had a man that um, bought this house. He closed on it, moved in. And like a day after he's moved in, he calls the realtor to say, I am super unhappy. I want to return the house. So um, Soren says, I'll come over, you know, I'll, I'll come to your house and meet and we can talk through this. Shows up at the house. 
And this man who's unhappy shoots him and then calls the police and says, I just shot this real estate agent. And by the way, um, you know, and then when the police come, he kills himself. So it was a murder suicide. You know, we don't have like a ton of, of motive on this case that I could find. But what we know is we know that Soren knew this man was extremely upset. Okay, so again, we we have to think through, and he was an older man, you guys, like an like an eighty four year old man. So I mean, this is an older gentleman that I'm sure nowhere in Soren's mind did he think I'm going to go to this house and get shot. But he did know he was upset. So what could we do differently in this situation? You know, um, first of all, if someone seems super erratic or unhinged, or you know, if they're calling and seem dangerous, call the police, tell the police, Hey, I'd like you to do, you know, a check on this person in this house. This is the situation I'm worried for their safety, for my own safety, for the neighborhood safety. Um, you know, I think, I think it's important to like take those kind of calls and things seriously. Um, and then again, like in this situation, you know, I can't come to the house, but can you meet me, you know, at, at a local coffee shop? Um, you know, can we, can we talk via FaceTime for a little bit so that, you know, I can see you and let's talk this through, um, anyway, you know, just any other thoughts on what you guys think in that situation being, being kind of a different situation, you know, what could you do in this situation where someone is extremely upset, you know, without going to the house and putting yourself in, in what can be a dangerous or, you know, in this case, a life ending situation. Is there any other thoughts on that you want to throw in the chat? Anything? I think, you know, just the, again, the most important is just really, I think we all, especially when we care about our clients and care about, um, you know, our, the people buying our houses, you know, the, the thing we want to do is like help them. Um, you know, I don't know because he didn't know him and because he wasn't like a past client and he bought this house sight unseen and had come from Alabama to Virginia. You know, I don't know if he had any, I didn't read anything that said he had a feeling this guy wasn't, um, you know, maybe mentally stable, but I do know that he knew what he, that he was, that the buyer was upset when he went to the house. Um, so and sometimes you're right. You just don't know. And that's the other thing is, you know, from everything I read, Soren went in without any sort of self-defense tool, weapon, plan. Um, again, I'm sure just thinking it's an upset buyer. I'm going to call him down. He's just angry, you know, never thinking he's he's going to pot potentially face Um you know, I didn't read that. Someone asked, did they do a final walkthrough prior to closing? I didn't read about that. I would guess they did, but you know, maybe it was done virtually. I know the guy moved from out of state. Oh, okay. You read that they did. I didn't see that part, but maybe they did. Yeah. And again, even if it's someone that let's say it's someone you've worked with um, and you've met several times, but they all of a sudden call you and they're really, really, you know, upset maybe just think about this case. Like, okay, if you don't know them, they're not a client you've worked with before. You even, if, you know, maybe if you've met them a handful of times, you know, still, could you say, can you come into the office? You know, something. Yeah, agree. I'm sure he was just like all of us. We just can't imagine that someone would do that. I think most of us try to see, you know, the best in people. And we certainly, again, we don't want to live our whole lives in fear and thinking everyone is out to kill us. But I think it's just super important to think about, you know, what is the best choice to make for safety? Thank you guys for your comments. The next um, woman is a young woman, 24 year old Lindsay Buziak. Um, Lindsay was a real estate agent in Canada. And this case happened in 2008. Um, and it's the, as I read about it, it said, Lindsay received a call from a woman looking for a house um, and she received this call on her cell phone, which they said they had two days to buy a house. They had a million dollar budget. They were cash buyers. Um, according to reports from her friends, she was suspicious about this call and even asked like, you know, Ooh, I don't know. How did you get my cell phone number? 
anyways, this lady says, oh, I, you know, got, got your cell phone from a past client. Well, she expresses concern about this, this couple from, or this woman who says she's married and coming to look at this house. Um, she expresses concern to her father and her boyfriend, but decides, according to reports, that it was going to be a great commission and she was going to go. So she meets them at this house. The um, woman said she would be alone and that her husband would not be able to join her. When she gets to the house, She Lindsay actually texts with her boyfriend, who's only nine miles away, and says, you know, I'm here. And he said, okay, just, you know, I'm checking in on you. Well, then the next time he texts her, she doesn't answer. He shows up at the house like 15 minutes after this initial text. And she's been stabbed 40 times. They have never solved this case. And they don't know, you know, what the motivation was. Um, you know, could this have been something personal? Possibly. But again, like, can we learn from this situation? The first thing that I noticed when I read this case is that she had a gut feeling that something wasn't right. Yeah, horrible. Um, you know, and I think that's, what's like, so, so, so sad to me is that, you know, she knew something wasn't right. And yet I'm sure young and hungry in her career, you know, okay, well, it's this, this great commission and surely I'll be fine. And then goes, you know, and meets such a horrific death. So the other thing to watch for when people push that kind of urgency, a lot of times it's, so that you don't have time to listen to your gut, to think through, to do some research, to get any wise counsel, to talk to a friend about it. A lot of times, you know, criminals will use that. I have to do it now. We have to go now. We I need to see it today. And that's something just to be kind of aware of. Um, I know that can be difficult in certain markets. Like we've been in markets here in Texas where it is like, oh my gosh, houses were flying off the off the market, you know, so fast and people were wanting to see something so quickly, but I'm thinking, you know, I'm talking more in terms of someone you don't know still, like it is so, so important, like to, to do, you know, the things that we know will help prevent you from, from being in this kind of situation. And that's meeting someone in a public place. Um, again, like getting someone else involved, maybe, you know, this is the only time I'm going to tell you it's fine to lie, but maybe you lie. Maybe you say, Oh, okay, no problem. Actually, um, the sellers have asked my husband to come look at something and make up something to come look at some, you know, a potential paint job on the back fence. And so my husband will be with me. Or, you know, um, I've actually got a contractor if you're a single woman. I've got a contractor that's meeting me there too. You know, if you're just a buyer's agent or say the sellers have someone coming. I mean, think of anything you can that's going to hinder someone from looking at you as opportunity. So think about those things, but most of all, most of all, most of all, listen to your gut. Um, also, I think about in the story when it says, you know, she asked, how did you get my cell phone? And they said a past client. I don't know this, but did she ask who the past client was? Maybe they said, maybe they rattled off a name. Maybe they couldn't give her a name. You know, that would be a red flag to me. But if they say, oh, so-and-so, you know, did she call that person and say, do you know this person? Do you, you know, what do you know about them? You know, do any sort of research, um, especially again, like I said, when you see those, those flags of like, I'm a cash buyer, I need to see it right now. It's just things that just immediately, you know, use some wisdom, use some logic and say, let me just make sure this is, you know, that I'm not going to end up hurt. Okay. And then last but not least, and this is kind of crazy. Let me see. What are we, how are we doing on time? Okay, good. Um, so last but not least, this case study, a little bit different, but again, I think we can really learn from this. And, and I hope what you're, what you're hearing about all of these cases over and over and over and over is listen to your intuition. Our bodies are created to sense danger. It, it is telling you something. So this is so crazy. Um, I have a slight connection, a random connection to this couple and um, acquaintance. I should say, but I used to go to San Diego when I was working as a speech therapist and I work in the school district and I would have the summers off. One of my best friends from Texas, but had moved to San Diego. Um, I would fly out pretty much right when school ended, when I had the summer off and I would go for like an extended San Diego vacation, a couple weeks at least. And, um, 
anyway, this, while I was out there years ago, I had met a group of people and one of the guys that I had met looked exactly like, and this is going to be a name some of you may know, I'm not huge in reality TV, but um, if any of you watched The Bachelor and Bachelorette, the very first Bachelorette, Trista married a guy named Ryan, who is from um, Colorado, the Vail, Colorado is where they live now, but he's from Fort Collins, Colorado, where I grew up. So I grew up with Ryan. So I'd actually watched that show. Well, um, they, this couple's, or while I was out in San Diego, I met this, this guy who looked very similar to Ryan Sutter. So randomly I had pictures from this trip. I'm showing my parents, you know, about all about my trip. And I say, oh my gosh, and isn't this so weird? This guy looked just like Ryan Sutter. It was so strange. I was like just dead ringer for Ryan Sutter. Fast forward months and months after this trip, I get a call from my mom and she is like, Lindsay, are you watching Dateline? And I don't know what, I don't know what I was doing, but I wasn't at the time. I remember I was like, no, why? And she said, well, I mean, I'm almost positive. The guy that you met in San Diego is on this Dateline show talking about his parents' murder. And I was like, what? Come to find out this guy that I had met, this is the story of his parents that happened um, in 2004. Um, so not, uh, I think it was after I had met him actually, I want to say, but anyway, um, just a random connection there. So looking into this story, this couple had retired and they had a sailboat that they were traveling on that, that, that they were living on and traveling on their, um, one of their children had a, their first grandson and they decided we're going to sell the boat and um, we're going to do it for sale by owner and we're going to move to be closer to our grandchildren. We can't do this boating life anymore. It's been so wonderful, but you know, it's time to get back closer to your family. So they list the, the boat for sale by owner. And um, again, you know, again, I just cannot preface this enough, like, or emphasize this enough. I mean, um, you know, when Tom and Jackie met the cup this this two men I'm sorry that first come to the boat to potentially buy this boat they immediately he immediately I should say is like something doesn't seem right like it just his gut was telling him something wasn't right well the criminal the one of the criminals kind of the mastermind of the whole thing can sense that he's not really buying this so he invites the perpetrator invites his wife who is pregnant and, and tells her and um, has her, has her come down to the boat and bring their like two-year-old daughter. So when you read into the story, you can watch it. I think at 2020, I want to, I think it's called like overboard if I'm not mistaken, but anyway, you can look into this case. It's, it is so sad and terrible. And it's so, so sad because of all the things that you know, you just think, oh, I wish they would have done this. But the the one thing is, is Tom definitely felt like something is not right. But then when he brought his wife, she was pregnant. She has a baby. Okay, well, it must be fine. You know, I think all of us are like, surely somebody that's like expecting a child isn't also a murderer, you know. When they, you know, they said when, when this couple comes, when the mother comes, the little kid comes, Jackie is like, Smitten. I'm sure they've said they're selling the boat because they're, you know, they are now new grandparents. So these people know, okay, they're, they're into family, they're into kids. Let's try to ease their mind this way. They agree. Okay. We're going to take the boat for a test drive on a different day. So they plan for a different day for the test drive. And on that day, after they leave this initial, this initial time that the perpetrators leave, they realize, okay, Thomas Hawks was like a bodybuilder, very, very fit, very in shape. And they're like, the two of us can't take the two of them. We're going to need a third person. So they bring this very big guy along for the test drive. Anyways, they go out to sea and again, horrific story, but they are overtaken, tied up, then eventually handcuffed to the anchor and thrown literally overboard to their death. A full story. These people have been caught there in prison, thank God. However, you know, one thing, again, like th in the story, you know, they had been talking to family about these potential buyers. And so these 
yes, I know, Sandra. I know they're so sad. And I don't like, I, again, I don't want you guys living in fear, but I want you to really see these faces and, and really remember like the, the, the most important thing is that all of them have something in common. They all had a gut feeling that something wasn't right or knew something wasn't right. Knew someone was upset, but for Thomas, you know, he really thought something wasn't wrong. So already so sad that he, that he went forward with this, you know, decision to take them out to see, but also then on board that he didn't have some sort of self-defense tool that was easily accessed. And again, it wouldn't have mattered if he had a self-defense tool that was in, you know, the glove compartment on the boat. It had to be on his person because when they overtook him in the captain or in the cabin of the boat, you know, he had to have access to that. Um, so just again, something to think about. These people are, you know, real people whose families are grieving of, over this loss and and we all think it won't happen to us. And, oh, it's a pregnant lady and her husband. Surely they're safe. And I just want you to remember, like, criminals come in all, all types, all types. And so we cannot just look at someone and know whether we will be harmed or not. We've got to listen to our intuition and be very, very wise. Um, okay, quick break for questions. And then we are just have a couple slides to wrap up today. Um, any questions? anything if not we'll move on you guys can use the chat if you need a minute i know the stories are they're so they're so sad oh they're so sad and it's just i think what i hope you know always by teaching this class is that i hear a story one day where someone says oh my gosh like i listened to my gut and i avoided this tragedy you know i really hope that you guys will take that seriously okay we will move on so situational awareness so being aware takes action all right because we are more distracted than ever in today's world obviously like with our smartphones smart watches smart cars smart everything we are constantly looking down or thinking about a million things or checking, you know, texts on a watch or whatever you may. So we are, we are so distracted. I read some different studies. One study says that people check their phones every 12 minutes. Another one said that on average, we check our phones 144 times a day. And you think about now we have, you know, everything is there. It's our, it's our email. It's our, you know, apps, it's uh internet, it's our camera, it's our social media, it's everything. And so we are super distracted. And, and sometimes just adding that awareness, I like to say, keep your head on a swivel could save your life. Because as much as we are being distracted, perpetrators are, are uh, you know, often looking for an easy victim. You know, they, they don't want someone that's going to put up a fight or they don't want someone that's seen their face and can recognize them or someone that's aware and can take action. They want someone they can catch by surprise. You know, they want the most vulnerable. So, you know, just thinking about before you go into a house, you know, stopping, looking around, taking notice, is there something strange? Is there, you know, a person that seems like they, you know, out of place? Is there a van that seems out of place? You know, um, just really making sure that you're, you're keeping your head on that swivel, looking all around you, being aware. Um, one of the things I know when I worked in in some more high crime neighborhoods, you know, and I talk with friends that are officers, they would say, you know, Lindsay, like, you know, of course, do the things like don't wear a lot of jewelry, um, you know, even like, you know, just just think about those kind of things, how you're dressed, and you know, also look people in the eye, like let them know you've seen them, like you make eye contact with people. And I think that's, you know, something we can all do too, as we're going into different houses is really looking around and not only could this save our own life, but it could save someone else's life. You know, so often, like we forget that we might be a key witness in something too. Um, I know this is a story that I think you're going to hear a little bit more if you go to the next class, but um, the story that happened in McKinney to the real estate agent, I believe Sarah Walker is her name. Um, you know, there was another agent that had met that same man, um, that helped to identify who her killer was. Um, 
And I don't remember if she saw him in an open house or if she'd seen him just in the neighborhood. But a lot of times, like we are out and about in these neighborhoods, like, you know, there are so many things we need to keep our eyes open for human trafficking. You know, are we, are we noticing children that look like they're out of place? Um, just all of those things. So it's, it's always, always good to take time to look around and be aware of your surroundings. Um, practice taking note of some things. So a lot of times too, like being aware takes practice like anything else in your life. So as you're going, maybe, you know, you start to look at, okay, I'm going to remember two to three things as I drive up to this house. Okay. There's, you know, a um, yard truck right there. Um, over there, there's a woman with a stroller over there, you know, and just training your brain to kind of look at what do you see? Um, it's, it's just a good practice to get into. Um, and being aware allows us to perceive potential danger. It's also like how our body can, can read messages. We can just determine whether something looks right or not. Again, it goes back to like incredible, um, fascinating part of the human body, which, you know, sometimes we just see something and it goes, okay, that something doesn't feel right, which I mean, it's just, it's incredible that our human body can do that. But I definitely, um, Definitely want you guys to start thinking about this and putting this into practice and trying to really, you know, especially before you get out of your car, you know, put your phone down for a minute, look around, what do you see, who do you see, and, um, you know, make sure you're safe. So taking your safety seriously and being prepared. So I want you guys to think about making a plan and putting this into practice before your brain goes into that fight or flight mode. So Again, it's like anything. If we practice CPR and then someone passes out in front of us, we're going to know what to do right then. Okay. If we have practiced something, we understand how to do it. Um, think about a safe word or a code or a phrase. If you need to text someone, you know, have someone in, in your, you know, whether it's in your office, in your family, or uh, several people that know, okay, if you text them something like, can you feed my dog, but you don't have a dog, they're going to know that means you're in trouble, you know, or whatever. And a lot of times it needs to be something that is coded because if you're um, very good, yes, the red folder. Yes. And I've seen that. I, I, I was thinking though, I'm like, gosh, I've seen that on in studying for these classes. I've seen that used. I'm like, I hope it's not overused where people now go, okay, we know that's a signal, but honestly, anything you can do is, is better than nothing. Um, there's so many safety apps too, with smartphones. Also, um, there's, you can call, I know on an iPhone, I'm sure Samsung has something like this, Android, but on an iPhone, if you quickly press the um, power button five times, then it calls 911, which is so crazy. I taught a class um, in Snyder, Texas, and this sweet lady who I've become friends with since, um, her husband had had a seizure in the night and, um, she, in her panic, she, well, she said she was trying to call 911 and for some reason her phone, it wasn't going through. And she remembered this class and did the five times on the side and was able to get through to 911 and they were able to get there and get into the hospital. So I was so thankful for that and hearing that. Um, using the buddy system, which is just take someone along with you just the other day, not kidding at my office, one of our agents was talking about how she was got a Zillow lead and this guy wanted to see this house here in Weatherford. And I was like, are you going by yourself? You've never met this person. She's like, well, I'm like, no, 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 you're not going by yourself. Like you don't know this person. You either meet them in person first, or you need to tell your husband and you need to make it clear to them that your husband's coming along, you know, and ask for his ID. And so anyways, I was like, you know, it's just, I think part of our nature is just to trust people, but we really need to put these things into practice. Also plan an on the spot excuse. So start thinking ahead of time. So let's say, you're, you don't see any, there are no red flags. You think this, you've met them in, in person, you met them at Starbucks, they seem fine, but you get to the house and something doesn't seem right. Maybe it's a couple that says they're coming as a couple. And now the guy shows up and it's him and two friends and they're big guys, or it's, you know, I don't know, just something that just doesn't add up or doesn't go in line with what you've planned. What do you do then? You know, for me, I would do anything I can not to get into that house. So Am I going to suddenly go, oh my gosh, something is going on with my grandmother. I'm so, so, so sorry. Forgive me. I've got to get my phone. And you call, uh, you know, and you fake a call and then roll down your window and say, I'm so sorry. You know, 
you get some information, maybe you get their license plate, you have police check them out, whatever you do. But if you get there and already something is wrong or you go inside that house and something is wrong, you get out of that house as soon as possible, you know, and you, you think about what could I say, you know, what would be my excuse? And of course, thank God, since we have phones, you know, we can quickly say someone's calling or someone just texted. Um, so that's, that's something that, you know, you can think about. Um, okay, that's a good question. One of the things so someone says for changes that prevent us from being targeted, why don't open houses just go away? Because it's number one, in my opinion, for criminals to target agents. Well, I would say one thing, you know, I don't know. I'm sure that's going to be a, that, that would be definitely a brokerage decision and seller decision to, you know, and I doubt that they will ever go away completely. But, um, one thing I would do, one small change you can do is I never ever market an open house and say, I will be, um, you know, at an open house ever on social media or an email. I always say we will be hosting an open house and they don't need to know that it's we and, and, you know, we means me and my Glock. It just, they just need to know that, you know, it will stop people from coming that want to target you if they think you're there with more people. And a lot of times our brokerage, we do. Um, more than one agent at an open house, especially for some of the larger houses, because someone needs to be kind of managing the door and someone needs to be able to walk around. Um, but, you know, again, it's nothing is ever worth your safety. So if you're at an open house, you need to be thinking about, you know, unlocking or, you know, kind of depends on the house, but do you keep one of the back doors unlocked? Do you know how to get out of the back door? Have you kind of looked around the house to see if someone comes in and I don't feel comfortable? Can I get out the garage? Um, you know, all of those things take seriously, you know, th that we need to take seriously and look through um, and think about. Um, thinking through potential dangers. So what another thing you can do is when you're watching true crime or just when you're reading the news and you hear about these situations, start talking through with a colleague, with your family. Um, you know, okay, if we were in that situation, what would we do? What would be something we could, we could do in this situation? You know, how could we have prevented it? How could we escape from it? Cause of course you're, you're going to have fight or flight. So can you fight? Do you have something that you can do to defend yourself or can you run? Can you escape? Can you get away? So um, you know, you need to think through all the different things. And it just, again, takes, takes you putting into practice this, this thought process. Um, and then small changes you can make, make from, you know, or prevent you from being targeted again, just no distractions, being very aware, using we on social media, um, having other people there going to the neighborhood first and talking to, the neighbors and saying, this is the car I drive. This is how, you know, the time I'm going to be there. Have you seen anything that, that concerns you? If you see anyone concerning, can you let me know? Can you come over? Can you call the police? You know, just doing anything like that would, would be wise. Um, and then of course, as we talked about also just meeting someone in person, getting to see them in public, ask them for their ID, look them up. And no matter what, as I've said before, even if all seems okay, listen to your gut. If it all seems fine, but you show up and your gut's saying something's wrong, then I would I would get out of there, make an excuse, you know? Um, so lastly, as I mentioned, you are the first line of defense. So if all seems right and you show up and you're still in a dangerous situation, there are some things you need to consider. So first and foremost, you know, what self-defense tools and weapons are out there? What are the options? What is right for you? Everyone is different, but no matter what you choose, whether it's pepper spray or whether it's a firearm, um, you have to know how to use it, how to use it accurately, safely. And again, that takes practice. Um, you know, you don't want the first time you've ever sprayed pepper spray to be in a situation like that. And, you know, think about where can you go where it'd be a safe place where you can spray, where you know how far it goes, you know how to do it, how do you get the safety off, all of those things. Um, if you're going to use a stun gun, I don't practice on anybody else, but you know, how do you use it? Where's the button to turn it on and off? Are you familiar with it? Can you get to it very quickly? When you're at a showing or an open house, I recommend, especially women, you know, think about what you're wearing that day. Maybe you wear, um, you know, crossbody little bags. So you can have your phone and your keys right there. Um, can you get to it? Maybe you, um, if you do carry a firearm, you know, can you carry on person, which is always best? Um, can you have your 
pepper spray right there in case you were to need it. Um, so being, you know, thinking about that. Um, Grace, what about door knocking? Do you mean going around in neighborhoods and, and marketing yourself? Is that what you mean by that? Okay. Um, you know, again, I probably wouldn't do that by myself. Um, I would probably bring a colleague along um, or a friend or a family member along. Um, I would very, I, I do carry a firearm. So I would actually, you know, I would absolutely carry if I went. And it probably depends on, you know, different neighborhoods, but, you know, you do it. That's a risk you take. I certainly wouldn't go inside someone someone's house. I would definitely stay outside if I were you. Um, but you know, I think if you have like a listing or an open house, I think it'd be a good idea to, um, you can always do a little research on the neighbors, you know, before you get there, but to introduce yourself to a couple neighbors, again, not by going into the house, but by, you know, going to the door and I would have someone with you. If it were me, I would anyways. Um, also think about first aid knowledge and tools. So do you know how to do CPR? Do you know, do you have a tourniquet? They have and so many resources now, I mean, it's, uh, just so quickly, you can go to Amazon and even get some of these first aid kits and tourniquets. I had a tourniquet um, that I carry with me. Um, sure, no problem, Grace. Um, anyway, I have a tourniquet that I carry with me in my car. Um, and if I'm at the gun range, I always have it. If, if there were to be an accident, if someone were to um, get hurt, you know, I would want to be able to have that because that's so important for stopping you know, someone from bleeding out. Um, so just think through those kind of things. Um, there's lots of online classes for CPR that you can do. And then lastly, you know, we hope that all of these tools prevent you from ever being in a situation. But if you are in a situation where you have to use um, lethal force, or sometimes some states call it deadly force, um, you know, what, what happens then? And um, the class safety has no asking price. That is a CE course that's being offered on the 27th, I believe, right? Yes. Um, that will go further into this situation. I think it's very, very wise to at least know, especially if you're going to use any sort of self-defense tools, but, but know this too, when it comes to lethal force or deadly force, um, if you're in your car, uh, you know, and, and someone were to be trying to get in your car with a, with a gun, with a knife or something, and you run them over, your car now becomes a weapon. Now you used it for self-defense, but at that point, when you use anything, even your hands for self-defense, um, if someone comes into your home and let's say you didn't have a firearm, but you pushed them and they fell down the stairs and were seriously hurt or, or killed, you would in an in, in, in investigation, excuse me, an investigation would be launched immediately. So even in a self-defense situation, our state laws say that, you know, investigation is lost and um, it's, it's started, I'm sorry. And you will, you will then, you know, be in a criminal case. So you need to know what to do. And one of the reasons I love, you know, partnering and working with US Law Shield or what we sometimes call Texas Law Shield, it started in Texas is because um, Texas Law Shield, first of all, they have so many safety resources that are phenomenal. Um, highly recommend you just checking out their website. It'll be on the last slide. Um, we'll make sure to get this PowerPoint to you guys. But, um, you know, when you, uh, if you were in this situation, they have basically, it's like prepaid legal fees. So they have a membership program. It's, it's like, basically the cost of like a venti cup of coffee these days, um, very, very small monthly fee that you pay to be a member of Texas Law Shield. It's also throughout the United States and almost all states, not quite, but almost. Um, and what would happen is if let's say that happened where you're at a showing and someone attacks you and you use any sort of self-defense tools, even your hands um, and that other, the, even though it's a criminal, they are hurt. Um, Texas Law Shield will cover your legal fees. As you guys can imagine, legal fees are astronomical, even when you're the good guy, even when you're the victim. So um, 
one of the things, you know, I love it. I hope I never, ever have to use it. I hope I never, ever, ever do. But I know like I was so thankful like my parents um, have retired. My dad, as I said, was a builder and retired and they have a big motor coach that they drive around. And in 2020, there were so many, you know, different times when riots were targeting these kinds of buses. And it, I thought, oh my gosh, like if my parents are in one of those situations, like, oh my gosh, I'm so thankful that they have this. Um, I hope they never are, but they have this legal team with top legal, you know, criminal defense attorneys, top legal advice that can help you in a situation where you do have to have, you know, use deadly force. And I highly recommend, like I said, it's not just for people who choose to use a firearm, but if you do choose to use a firearm, I would very, very, very much recommend obviously getting a lot of training in that. And then also, you know, joining Texas Law Shield so that you are covered in the event that you have to use it. Um, Anyway, so I know we covered so much today um, and I so appreciate you guys being here. I really, really highly recommend going to this next class. Like I said, it's going to be a slight, you know, maybe some of the same things talking about a little bit about situational awareness, but he goes into a lot more um, detail on all the self-defense options, lethal and non-lethal options for you guys. Um, he is Houston local, so he'll be able to tell you where you can practice. Um, anyway, so really, really highly recommend. And it's for credit. It's for CE credit. So I would just, I would say definitely go there and start putting into practice some of these things we talked about today. My information is also on the slides, and I'd love to hear from any of you. If you guys have any questions afterwards, please feel free to call or email and um, hopefully, and hey, yeah. I love getting to know people down there too. If we ever can send referrals your way, or if you have people moving up here, you let us know and we'd love to help you guys out or work with you guys too in the real estate facet. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Even I was, I'm not a realtor, but I was taking note because you never know what could happen. It, like you said, it can happen to anyone. So better be safe than sorry, correct? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. And I'm going to head with the closing comments. But if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll make sure to answer that while I'm closing out the webinar. Like Lindsay said, we do have an in-person class, two hours of CE credit, all about safety. Um, safety has not asking price. That's with Mike Wan. He's great. It's going to be at HR Central, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And I'm going to put the link for, to register for that in the chat. Uh, so next week on Tuesday, um, September 19, we have a webinar uh, talking about your mental health and how it correlates with you selling real estate and all the steps that you can take to make sure that you're giving you 100% in your personal life as well as in your business. I'm going to put both of those links to register for the in-person class and the webinar on Tuesday in the chat. Uh, this webinar was being recorded, so we are going to go ahead and send you that via email, as well as Lindsay information and the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Lindsay, I would like you to have the last word. This was great. Thank you so much for joining us and doing this for us, especially September is safety month, so this was very important for us to hear. Yes, absolutely. Well, I appreciate all of you for joining. It's so fun. And I feel like, again, it's such an important topic. And I just want to encourage you to really just, if, you, if you've learned anything, to trust your gut, trust your intuition, stay safe. Um, please share any experiences with me. I always love hearing from you guys. I love hearing that you're putting these things into practice. If you have any suggestions or other safety tips that you think would be critical for us to add to these classes. We would love to hear those too. And um, just appreciate your time. And thank you so much. It was so fun to have this, this time together and do this. I'm glad. Thank you. I'm sure we will see you again at another HR program. I hope everyone has an excellent weekend and we'll see everybody soon. Okay. Thank you guys so much. All right. Bye-bye.